This morning, if I'd have a thought that I'd want you to remember, it'd be the words of the final preacher, the word of the Lord, John the Baptist, when he said, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who has warned you? And, and I want each one of you to give some thought this morning. First of all, two weeks, no, it's two months, not two weeks, two months from right now, we will be starting a revival meeting. So it's, it's that close to us. And I hope that you have not waited this late to begin to be thinking about revival meeting. I thought when I uh, was thinking about my text this morning of asking uh, how many of you have someone, someone that you would like to see saved during this revival meeting. And, and, I, and I'm not going to, I, I really thought I'll ask to see their hands, but I don't want to do that because I don't want to embarrass anyone. Somebody might not be able to put theirs up, but somebody might put their hand up and it really wasn't being honest with me. So I'm not going to put you in that position. But have you someone that you would like to see saved during that revival meeting? Now, I mentioned to you some time back that we need to be thinking about individuals, not just say, well, we want to have a big revival. You won't ever have a big revival until you begin to start thinking about individuals. And, and I mean that in all sincerity. Then I thought, how many of you here would like to see somebody saved that may not even come here to this revival meeting? You see, we get the idea sometimes that people can only be saved during revival meetings, and that is not according to the word of the Lord. Now, we need to be sure that we understand that, that, that it is a harvest time, and it is a time whenever there are greater emphasis is placed upon lost people than any other time. And if the Lord will permit, I'll spend most of my time in preaching to lost people. Not to the church. You know, I've got 50 plus Sundays out of the year to be able to preach to the church. And so I don't need to be preaching to the church. I don't need to be preaching to you as one of God's children. But you've designated this as a harvest time, and that means for lost souls. That also means that it's impossible for me to preach to lost people if they aren't here. And so the only way that we can get them here is, is that we as individuals accept some of the responsibility to get them here. And one of the ways that you can help in doing that and make it a lot easier for yourselves and for me too is that we've been praying already that the Lord would help us and that He would be touching the hearts of some of those people who are lost so that whenever that we go out and we invite them that they'll be receptive to that invitation. You may remember in the Word of the Lord, there's a portion of the Word that talks about the man who made a marriage feast for his son, and he sent his servants out to call those who had been bidden, those who had been chosen, those who had been invited to come. And when they went out, he sent the Word out with them and said, Come, for all things are now ready. Come, for all things are now ready. And, and so we need, whenever it gets to be revival time, we need to be ready as God's children. We need to be prepared for that time. And truly it does need to be a harvest time. But don't get this idea in your head that we have to wait until then or that that's the only time that people can be saved because people can be saved anytime, any place, anywhere. I'd love for them to be here. I, I'd love to see people get saved. I, it's an experience that uh, is better than anything else probably other than your own experience of salvation that you can experience. It's to see somebody else saved. What a, what a privilege that is for us to enjoy. And it's a blessing to us. It's a blessing to the church when that can happen. But that just doesn't happen just out of happenstance. It's, it happens because God's people have been preparing and they've been listening to the voice of the Lord as He speaks to them. And when they go out then, they go out with a message that says, Come for all things are now ready. 
There are going to be some who, who, who might come that you say, well, I can't imagine what they're doing here. Don't worry about that. Let the Lord take care of that. You know, whenever that the, the, they finally, the first time those servants went out, and this isn't even my message this morning, so I'm going to spend a little time here. I don't know what made me get off on this, but it's not what. Who has warned you is my thought this morning. Who has warned you? And then that's going to come back to you. Each one of you who are here this morning are going to have that responsibility out here. Who has warned you to flee the great wrath which is to come? John asked those people who came down there to be baptized of him in the River Jordan. Who, 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 who told you about this? But this man sent his servants out and when they went out they were mistreated. They were not very well received. Our people, many of God's children today, have been misled to believe that when they go out here, the world is going to fall down at their feet because they say they're a Christian and they're there, they're there to help you. Well, let me tell you something this morning. If I study the word of the Lord correctly, Jesus never once indicated to his disciples that you're going to go out there and they're just going to open you or welcome you with open arms. Quite the contrary. So I don't know what needs to think us that we're of better caliber or that we've got a better qualification than those men did that when we go out here and we carry the message and say, come for all things are now ready, that we're going to be received any differently than those men were. We're not. You just need to understand that. But now I want you to listen to what the word of the Lord says. The Lord said to the old prophet Ezekiel, he said to that, I want you to get up and I want you to go. Now I'm going to tell you right now, you can just come in here and sit down and enjoy every service that we have throughout the entire revival meeting. And you can just say, boy, we had a good time. I mean, we enjoyed the singing. We thought the preaching was probably as good as he could do. And you can get up and you can go home. And, and, and that's what it'll be. It'll just be a, a, a number of services. But if you really want us to have a revival meeting here, it's going to mean you're going to have to get up out of the pew and you're going to have to go out here into the mission field and do some work for the Lord. And I will guarantee you there is enough work that every single one of us can do some work. Now, it isn't all going to be done exactly the same time and exactly the same way, but exactly the same people. But God will touch your heart and allow you to know if you will allow him to. Ezekiel, I want you to get up and I want you to go and I'm going to send you down to the children of Israel. I'm not going to send you to a people of a strange speech or a hard language. I'm not going to send you to someone. Uh, we, were, we were talking over the weekend about speaking Mexican or Spanish and I can't speak either one. I know about two or three words. And that's about it. And I spent many years working with and among the Mexican people. And so you just thought, well, you should have picked up a little. But I, I didn't. But God did not send me to a people of a hard speech and a strange language. I have a preacher friend that God at one point in time called him to go to Japan to preach. And he said, Lord, I don't know any of the Japanese language. And he didn't. But he got in and he started studying and, and he went before he really was fluent in the Japanese language and he learned a lot while he was over there. But God blessed him so richly. And so I know God can do things like that. But you see, God is not asking you to go somewhere to a foreign country. God's just asking you to go right here among the people that we live among, that we understand, that we know, some of them who are our family, some of them who are our neighbors, some who are our friends. And, and so he's not sending us to a di into a difficult field in that respect. He said to Ezekiel, he said, I want you to go down there and I want you to preach unto the people. I'm send you to a, uh, I'm not sending you to a people of a hard speech and a strange language, but I send you to the children of Israel. And this is what he said. He said, and I'm going to send you down there and they'll not hear you. They'll not hear you. Now, how would you like to have that start? If the Lord were to speak to your heart today and say, I want you to go over here and speak to so-and-so that lives right across the street or lives and your neighbor, and I want you to just talk to them about me, but I can tell you already, they're not going to receive you. You're not going to be well received. You know what most of us are going to say? There's no use for me to go. 
There's no use for me to go if I already know they're not going to listen. Well, most of us don't hear that message from the Lord. Most of us have already got our mind made up anyway, but it isn't going to do any good. I'm, I'm not qualified enough. They need to go see the preacher. They need to go up there to the church. Well, that isn't always the case. Sometimes God has a message for you to deliver, and you need to deliver it. Yeah, it may not be any more than just say, you know what, I'm interested in you. I'm interested in, in your soul. I'm interested in your well-being. I'm interested in, in you. And that's what they're looking for. They don't care about how many we've got in Elkton Baptist Church. They don't care what the, the, the regulations are to be a part of Elkton Baptist Church. They don't care about the preacher up there. They're not concerned about those things. And, and they don't really care that you tell them all about those things. What they're interested in is knowing whether you're really concerned about them or whether you're just out here trying to meet your expectations or someone else's expectations in doing something. So don't go out of here in the next week or the next month or the next day, whatever time may be, and say, well, I'm doing this because the preacher got up there and said I needed to do it. It won't fly, folks. Anyway, the Lord says, Ezekiel, you go down there and you preach, speak to these people. But I can already tell you they're not going to hear you. But he said, you know the reason they're not going to hear you? The Lord said, because they won't hear me. Now what makes us think today that people are going to hear us if they won't listen to the Lord? We can't even begin to compare to him. And he says, they'll not hear me, but you go anyway. He says, you go and you say to them, thus saith the Lord God. Now I'm convinced that there is no substitute for the word of the Lord. That does not mean that you have to go to call on somebody and say, well, you know, I'm here and I want to quote to you John 3, 16. I want to give you the Roman road. I want to tell you this particular scripture and I know all of these by heart and I can quote them all. They don't really care how much you know or how little you know, excepting that you care about them. And that's not hard to let them know. You always hear these people who are talking about, oh, we need to send, we need to send our missionaries over to some of these countries of starving people. Let me tell you something. Those starving people don't really care how many missionaries come over there. What they care about is whether or not they get some food in their stomach. Now, that's the first thing you've got to take care of. And then maybe they'll hear some of what is being said. Lost people aren't really interested in what maybe we're wanting to see happen. But what they do know is whether or not you care about them as an individual. You go down there and you preach to those people and whether they hear or whether they will forbear, they'll know there has been a prophet among them. Yeah, they're going to know. You may not see the results that you anticipate. You may not see the results that you would like to see. But I will guarantee you that if you do what the Lord wants you to do, He'll bless you. Now here I'm going to get to my message. Then the Spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing. This is Ezekiel saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from His place. I heard also the noise I'm reading out of the um, third chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Um, I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and the noise of great rusting. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Now there are going to be some times whenever that I know that we're not going to be happy where the Lord sends us to do a work. We kind of like to pick and choose. We kind of like to go to the people that we want to go to. But God doesn't always let you go to the people that you want to. Sometimes he's got a more difficult one for you to handle. Maybe he's got, it's not as easy. But you know what sometimes that'll do? That'll make us depend more upon him. We have to say, Lord, you know, I can't, I can't do this by myself. I'm going to need your help. And we do need his help every time, whether we think so or not. Anyway, Ezekiel said, the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness of spirit. 
and the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity of Telabib that dwelt by the river of Chebar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. Well, Ezekiel says, The Lord lifted me up, took me out here, and sent me down among these people. And I was there seven days, sat among them, and I was astonished. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Who hath warned you to flee the great wrath which is to come? The old preacher asked those people who came. Who warned you? Ezekiel, I'm making you a watchman unto those people. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. If you, if I speak to you to go warn him and you don't go warn him, he's going to die in his sin. And that's not going to change. But his blood will I require at your hand. You are responsible. Don't you think for a second this morning that every single one of us as a child of God doesn't have a responsibility to see that the word is declared. Too many people get the idea that's the preacher's job. To preach. Well, my job is to preach the word, all right, but I'll guarantee you he didn't leave the authority for the proclamation of the word to preachers. He left it with the church. The church is the one who has the authority. Saved people have the responsibility to preach the word, to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he holds us accountable for how we conduct ourselves. In the word of God, there's only one thing that I find in there that distinguishes me from the rest of you, and it is the woe pronounced upon me if I preach not the gospel. Yeah. But don't you think for a second that that excludes you from carrying out the work of the Lord. He said, you go out there and you warn them. If you don't warn them and they're going to die in their sin, but I'm going to hold you accountable for them. Now listen, yet if thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Yeah, it just depends on, you know, Ezekiel, how you want to be standing with me. You cannot go out here and save anyone. Not a single one of you can do that. I don't care how much scripture you know. I don't care how much of the Spirit of the Lord you have. I don't care how close you live to the Lord or how far you live from the Lord. You cannot save a single soul. But you can Tell them about one who can save them. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't, don't ever go out here thinking you're going to do any great thing because you really aren't. Neither am I. I never have and never will. It's God who has to do the work. But he does that through us many times. But he does say unto us, you know what? If, if you don't warn him and he dies in his sin, then I'm going to hold you responsible. Now you're going to say, oh, preacher, this is Old Testament. Well, let me tell you what. The New Testament is in agreement with it. Guarantee you that. But if you do go and you warn him and he still fails, then his blood is upon his own head. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity. Remember what Paul said? Paul said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also, also be tempted. Now what is he saying? He's saying there are going to be some times when even the righteous, even the God's children, are going to stray away from the Lord. We used to call it backsliding. We don't like that term anymore. It, 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 it sounds too uh, antiquated, I guess, or it sounds not very pleasant. Backslider. But, but so we've, we've, we've come around a little bit. Don't use it often. The truth of the matter is it's still what happens. People get away from the Lord, and, and, and they need 
to have some encouragement. They don't need to be kicked down, propped down, criticized. They need to be helped. They need to be instructed. They need to know that we care about them. Anyway, he said, When a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and, lie, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require thine hand. Who hath warned you? We'll see here again. Who's responsible for it? We as God's children. Ezekiel was responsible. His responsibility was to do what the Lord was telling him to do. Your responsibility and my responsibility is to do what the Lord is telling us to do today. I cannot be held accountable for you, neither can you be held accountable for me. But every one of us are going to be accountable under the Lord as to what we have done. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. Who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? I'll tell you who's going to warn them. It's not going to be that they're going to come in here on Sunday morning and hear me preach necessarily, because many of them aren't going to come. But you, if you listen to the voice of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is one of His children from time to time. Now, not every day, not every week, maybe not every revival. Are you just going to be on fire for the Lord and be out here? Because most of you are like me. You're going to have those ups and down times, spiritually speaking, in your life. So there are going to be times whenever they just say, boy, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in that person. I'm really concerned about their soul. And, and you can do them some good. And there are going to be other times that all we can think about is where we're at in the eyes of the Lord. And, and, and if you're like me, there are times when you know you're not just exactly where you need to, do, to be. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus, you remember what he said? He said, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? First, first, take care of your own eyesight, and then you'll be able to see to take care of the other person. Now, that's paraphrasing. That's not quoting King James Version. So, but, but that's what he's saying. You know, before I can do anyone else any good, I've got to get myself right with the Lord. I've got to be to where He can take me and He can use me. And I'm not always there. I'm not always there. You can't always tell. You don't always know. But I know, and the Lord knows. And there are some times, so, that I can say as the old prophet did, Here am I, Lord, send me. 